basically the theme of my lecture about the image as emblem and as storyteller, and this is, this is something that I believe in and that I want to illustrate, is uh, I want to explain basically the, the, the meaning of the title. Uh, to begin with, uh, from the, I believe that from the time of uh, Bramante through Schinkel, right down to Leonidov and uh, Mies and beyond, the image has always played a very important ideological role. In, and in, in this sense, a kind of a, the image of a project um, is before the project is even realized, conveys the meaning of the project. So I think to begin with the image is a kind of an agent of propaganda, if you like to say. Um, it's a kind of proclamation in itself. It's a statement of belief. I think images really are statements of belief. And consequently, the kind of it's an agent of ideology. As a storyteller also, because of the fact that it, it contains within it a given narrative, whether that's an ideological narrative, it also, carrying in that night, also explains. I mean, it also explains a project even, even before it is being built. It explains a, the, the, the contents, the, 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 the aims, the targets of a project. So from, from this point of view, um, I've been working myself with this uh, belief in mind. And I start, I, I start back with 1980 with the Venice Biennale, the, the one by Paolo Portoghese of the year 18, 1980, which was a time by a, a moment by when by which my collaboration with Rem Kolhas uh, was already uh, kind of developed to the point that it was up to the, up to the moment when I left the Office for Metropolitan Architecture. And uh, it is significant that it, it happened this in the middle of a time that was basically the apotheosis of postmodernism. I mean, the, the uh, Paolo Portoghese's uh, Strada Novissima in, uh, at the Arsenal on Biennale in 1980, with, with the, the subtitle of the, the presence of the past, was in fact the apotheosis itself of postmodernism, and it, it, it contained the strata novissima, contained the facades of all the architects, of all the postmodernist architects that were the internationally known postmodernist architects. So, so it had been always, it had been a mystery uh, as to how we had been invited to take part in this kind of exhibition, given our hostility, the hostility that we had always exhibited to the movement. And uh, as uh, I think Charlie Jenks was a, to a great extent involved, both being the inventor of the term for architecture, at least, I mean, postmodernism existed as a term for literature, but in architecture, it was Charlie Jenks that introduced the, the, the notion. And because we were close friends with Charlie at the time, it may have been his uh, way of teasing us. I mean, his, his quizzical sense of humor of getting Portuguese to invite us in this weird, but it was for us a very important challenge, very important challenge to see ourselves in that mixed. And so I begin with uh, the, uh, the kind of uh, image of our exhibition in the midst of this uh, postmodernist monumental uh, exhibit. This is the front, this is the facade of our own, uh, of our own uh, part, I mean, the, our own room. It's just a stretched gauze um, that uh, went from, from, from ceiling to floor. And, uh, and it was pierced by, uh, by uh, 
uh, stick with a, with a kind of a 50s style uh, a, a noticing in, in neon lights OMA. And, uh, and, the, and the design for it was this, this is the design of the front and the back, the front being from the Strada Novissima and the back being from being inside of the room looking out. It, and that was to coexist with the, the facades of the, the, the famous architects of the postmodernist movement. For instance, this is a facade. To the left, we have a, a kind of a combination of the of the of the of all the facades that had were built on the right, the one by Hans Holein. Here we have uh, to the left the uh, facade of Bob, my, my future boss at Yale, Bob Stearns facade, and then uh, Michael Graves, both of whom, both people with whom I later col collaborated as a teacher with Michael at Princeton and with Bob at Yale, for, with Bob for many years at Yale. Um, Arata Isozakis, with whom I also had uh, a, a kind of a very, uh, very lively experience with, with, with which is, I think, is, is the, it's the project I, that illustrate at the end or, or one before the end. And to the right, Frank Gehry, whom I kind of met uh, when we were both very old, uh, uh, two years ago, three years ago at Yale. He looked at me in a kind of a surprised manner. I said, I think I know you. <laughs> I don't think you could remember my name. Um, to the left, I don't remember who is this entry, but this is, of course, Venturi's and Denise Scott Brown's. On the right, Franco Purini and Laura Termes, and of course, Massimo Scolari, with whom I have remained a friend. Massimo with his uh, always monumental ideological uh, and uh, architectural uh, uh, insignia. So here we are with uh, the hours. In, in contrast to all the monumental uh, uh, postmodernist, which is kind of ironical because I have always been attracted and I've always loved monumental architecture. And for me, designing is kind of designing monuments. But there you are, this is the kind of uh, those, uh, 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 those paradoxes that one is confronted frequently. Um, so here is the the overall photograph of the of the Strada, and again it, this is ours and our drawing. Now we have, uh, I mean, just going to the kind of my my own influences in the design. For my my primary influences had been. Uh, on the one hand, the uh, super studio and, uh, the, and, the, and the continuous monument, monument again, or uh, the uh, Archizoom and the uh, uh, No-Stop City, uh, kind of again, a monumental, a monumental uh, critique, if you like, of, uh, of, uh, of contemporary consumerist society. And the Shepka, here we are again, uh, myself collaborating with one of my students in the same way, collaborating now in, the, in, the, in my old age, as I was in a younger age with a student of mine, first with Rem and now with uh, Pierre Vittorio Aureli and Martino Tatara uh, in this project in which they take one of the uh, Follies of mine, uh, which I had called uh, um, uh, immeuble cité, we kind of way, where I I take um, the, the, the paraphrase the immeuble villa of uh, Le Corbusier uh, and design a building um, and, and a, a, a conceive of a building that I believe is a city in its own right, 
a, a build so so it, uh, it it was a kind of an obsession some uh, 10 15 years ago uh, when i was giving it to my students i was giving as a project design a house for 50000 people and so from there here in this project uh, in the, the in in what what dogma called stop city they've surrounded their, their green with eight immobile cities and uh, of course and my other big influence has always been uh, malevich and 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 his monumental models of the tectonic just as he had been uh, a great influence for zaha hadid who also was one of my students and who also influenced me like students do students i i get i was all i always get influenced by students and i tell them you ought to be you ought to be aware that i am copying you because i i try to teach that copying is a very is a very good educational exercise because one learn one learns through copying and a copy is never really a facsimile there's always something different there's always some step taken in a copy that makes it different from the original and it's an educational one of the best ways of learning and going back to my influences um, the project called uh, uh, locomotiva due by by rossi uh, when he was still an architect in fact at least he was in collaboration with somebody who was a real architect polezello in this monumental uh, uh, monumental building in torino so you can see the the impact of the of the texture of that of the, of the, of the, of the, in the impact of that building it, it was a um, centro industri uh, in centro industrial i forget what it was called anyway it was a very big uh, a very big, big intervention and you can see it in relation to the context of this of the, of the tissue of torino to which it was uh, it was placed and that was also one of my big influences and as i said monumental architecture has always been a big influence for me and this led to the first project that uh, we did one of the first projects that we did uh, with rem uh, he was had he had finished um, he he was no longer my student but we 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 did together he had just been my student we did together a project that was um, sprung out of a fascinating study that rem had did as part of his history studies on the berlin wall uh, and 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 it was a it was a very inspiring study which suggested that the the berlin wall was a magical instrument for the authorities in berlin what the impact of a piece of architecture to that city was incredible and devastating for 40 years and one of berlin's most important monuments uh, we're using the wall we we, we we produced a project called exodus which we call exodus or the voluntary prisoners of architecture that, i mean the, the 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 narrative meaning that uh, to do architecture you'd have to be a voluntary prisoner of it um, and so therefore in a way it was the whole concept was created by architects i mean because they were prisoners of architecture they were all architects and uh, after that project both rem and i in the 70s moved to new york and and kind of new york was uh was the the, the big influence 
for both of us. Of course, he wrote Delirious New York as a project, and I worked on a lot of fantasy projects, partly some of them together with Rem, and some of them we, we, did, we did individually, working, to, working in the same premise, and in collaboration sometimes with Matthias Ungers, who, uh, for whom Rem went to the United States to spend some time at Cornell, where Matthias was teaching at the, at the time, at that time, in those endless fights that uh, existed, that happened between Colin Rowe and Matthias Ungers. And uh, this leads me to uh, the, the, the trip to New York, which meant that we sort we cohabited. I mean, I, 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 at the time that I went to New York, I was living in the apartment that uh, Rem was renting. Uh, to start with, it was uh, in Ithaca, but then shortly by 1973, we moved to New York. And uh, that's where I came in uh, contact with the paintings of Madeleine Friesendorf, um, Rem's wife, who was one of the most imaginative and talented painters I've known, and who together with Rem conceived of the New York buildings, all the, all the buildings of Manhattan as personalities with their own private stories and their own private histories. So that for instance, here we have uh, and, it, it, and this, uh, the title of this project was uh, Flag, Flagrant Delete. And it is, uh, this is where uh, the RCA building catches the uh, Empire State with a Chrysler building in bed. Um, and uh, the, all the buildings of Manhattan, including the Statue of Liberty are looking in from outside from the window. And, and the series of more, a series of other paintings, which, get, which got me very much uh, um, attached to the idea of using paintings, copying paintings or incorporating paintings in my own work. Uh, and always working with some, something that was painterly, whether, I was, whether it was using br the brush, with, mostly working with acrylic, but sometimes watercolors, especially with the, with the help of uh, Zoe and uh, Zoe Zengelis, my first wife, and um, Madelon, but sometimes even in oil. And here are some of the painters that influenced me and that I used um, in my work, like uh, Magritte or Hockney, and especially in all the in all my landscape projects, which are not part of this talk, um, all the various parks that I worked with, uh, Rousseau Le Douanier, Rousseau, uh, kind of semi-primitive uh, painter, French painter, um, whose paintings we used extensively, and Manet, of course, the the on certain occasions the whole symbolism of the Déjeuner sur l'herbe by Manet was stolen by us and incorporated in for reasons, for, in their own, for its own reasons in various projects. And of course, Dali. Um, Rem was very, very much obsessed with Dali and influenced by Dali. And in fact, uh, his style of writing is very Dalinian if one reads for instance, D Dali's uh, autobiography uh, and, um, and Delirious New York, you can see a great similarity in literary style. And this is, uh, and, uh, the, and Dali's obsession with uh, one particular painting, which was the Angelus by Millet, um, which illustrates the, uh, almost religious 
concentration of the two farmers at the end of the day, at the time of the Angelus, thanking God and Providence for, for the fruits of life. That was a painting that, uh, that Dali was uh, obsessed with and uh, which he copied and did various, various alternative interpretations of, including this one. Um, and here we are, this, this is us at the time um, in our youth um, with Zaha standing behind us. She'd been a student and uh, then she worked with us for, for, for a year. And in uh, and the front row on the left, the guy with the tie is Rem. The guy with the glasses is me. Zoe Zengelis is in the shadow, and Madeleine Friedendorf is on the right. And here we are using ourselves in the collages that we did for uh, Exodus, um, using the kind of images that Dali had also extensively used. And this is a project um, for Exodus, which runs east-west, more or less, I mean, as you can see, uh, running uh, along, let's say, uh, Oxford Street and Bayswater, kind of parallel to, uh, to Hyde Park and Kensington Gardens to, to the south, and uh, with its own history of uh, Incorporating a series, a series of uh, of uh, social uh, institutions, communal institutions, uh, into the midst of London, which we were calling a kind of a dormant metropolis, or uh, Rem used to call it not a city, but a holding pattern, uh, and. Um, we incorporated this monumental, uh, uh, this monumental uh, intervention uh, the, with the north-south axis uh, cutting it through the center and the kind of uh, other axes or ways of entering being these red, red lines that were supposed to be uh, all new housing housing projects that would uh, turn the rest of the of London into ruins uh, with the exception of the Nash sequence which of course the Nash sequence as one of the precursors if you like of uh, of modernity if you like even though he was a gazamper he was uh, you know he was one of the uh, according to our narrative one of the precursors of of, of the modern and and therefore we keep the whole sequence from regions from regions park down to haymarket and to the to the close to the uh, down region street and down haymarket and the forget now um, james st james park and these are a few um, illustrations and i think i'm going and and some of the collages um, in which again the, the the idea of we had not, neither of our, neither of us had yet gone to New York but the idea of New York and uh, behind the wall uh, taken from a life magazine uh, issue on Manhattan where where these uh, where photographs taken from the I don't know what they call these photographs kind of a light from temperature uh, and uh, the whole iconography of uh, the wall the Berlin Wall and the uh, sacred interior the prison that was uh, that was that was inspired from um, 
from the myth of Manhattan and of the prison, with the, 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 with the prisoners being volunteers that, that moved out of mediocrity into excellence. That was the whole idea. They, and, and there was all institutions like the baths, uh, but apart from the, but, and, but there was only also one uh, private allotment, which was dealing with as a compensation to uh, the communal social institutions of which the rest of the project was made. And here are some views of it, of, of a model that we made, and which led to the, uh, to the project of the called the square of the captive globe, which is again, which is the, if you like, a, a kind of apotheosis of Manhattan in which the grid holds the, the globe captive and the globe of course represents is Central Park and all the, the architecture of Manhattan is based on the principle that since we have the grid and since all the bases are identical, they're all, all of made of identical granite, then what happens on top is a free for all. You, you have everything is possible because everything is held together by the, by the common language of the grid and of the and the foundations of the of the blocks. Here I I, I bring in the another important uh, myth or not so much a myth, but the, another important painting. Uh, a painting by. Um, by Jericho, the Rado de la Meduse, the Raft of the Medusa, which illustrated the kind of a, 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 a known historical fact, which was uh, the, 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 the shipwreck of, uh, of the Medusa and, uh, and the surviving uh, few uh, people on the raft who were picked up weeks and weeks after the, uh, uh, on a raft uh, and who were surviving, few survivors, most of them dying and also with cannibalism apparently beginning, beginning to take place for the survival. And they became an important, uh, an important, uh, uh, emblem for us, if you like, an important, important propaganda in that we, we equated them with, and that's a little bit cruel on our part, but we equated them with, uh, with the current or fashionable architects of New York at the time, because they had all attacked us and, uh, and, and, and and uh, we're uh, saying, who are these two arrogant people who are coming here disturbing our peace? So we, we called them, we equated them with the uh, survivor, with, with the, uh, uh, the, the survivors on the raft of the Medusa. And here they are kind of dropping on a project that, that of mine at the time, which I did on the, on the axis between the east-west axis and where that east-west axis ends up on the East River, and, and which I called the egg of Columbus Center, because because you know yourself another another arrogant statement of ours, which makes me blush today when I've gone old. When we were claiming that architecture is easy, like the it's like the egg of Columbus. I mean, one shies away later, at one's old age, from uh, many of the blunders that one did when one was younger. 
And here was a project after our, after close to a decade, decade of work in New York, just before we uh, returned to back to Europe, basically to London, where we assembled together all the various projects that we had either had done together or separately in uh, New York and, and especially on the Roosevelt Island. Um, and here we have a painting in which we have the raft of the Medusa at the bottom um, crashing with Rem's floating pool, which is at the top. And the crash occurs in the middle of that painting. And more uh, illustrations of proposed projects like a project on Roosevelt Island in which we dropped a Malevich tectonic on the intersection with, uh, when, with normal ben, Norman, Norman Belgedes ship. And this is a facade of it. And this is um, uh, Rem's counterpart to my project, which I called the Sphinx Hotel. This, uh, in his case, it was a welfare palace hotel. Both the Sphinx Hotel and the Welfare Palace Hotel were in response to uh, the so-called welfare hotels in which uh, the New York so-called bums, as they were called, in other, words, in other words, homeless people were housed and that the New, New, the New York society was complaining that the bums were urinating in the in the hostels in which they were in the welfare hotels in which they were put and our response to that was they urinate because of the dismal conditions that you give them if you gave them palaces like a hilton they would not urinate and so we did two projects one being rem's welfare palace here and the other one being mine, which I call Sphinx Hotel. And here is an illustration of Welfare Palace in which, at the, which is on, on the tip of, uh, of Roosevelt Island. So it's on the East River. And you have at the bottom, the raft of the Medusa. And on the right, the, 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 the floating pool, which is on its course to crashing. And this is the uh, Sphinx Hotel. I already said the, what, the, what this was about. It was uh, on Times Square facing the Times building. Um, and was again for the same purpose, giving luxury accommodation to the so-called bums, to the homeless. Um, and and it, as it was facing, it is exactly facing the Times building. And as the Times building facade was littered with uh, signs, signals, and advertising. So was ours with their uh, equivalent, with their opposite, um, with their opposite uh, um, ideological signs, if you like. It, like for instance, the Lenin's Tribune um, by Lisitsky was incorporated in, on the front of um, the Sphinx Hotel facade. And in the Sphinx Hotel, the, what I called the, the neck, there were a series of, uh, so of, of collective social facilities from a little park, a mini park, a hairdresser, a gym, a swimming pool, a bar, and the planetarium. And this is a view from the swimming pool and bar and the planetarium with a view to, uh, to Manhattan over the clouds with only the Empire State 
and the twin towers of the World Trade Center sticking through the cloud. As people were, were attacking me for doing, for de doing inordinate, inordinately high, inordinate, inordinately tall buildings here, I illustrated that the Sphinx Hotel was shorter than the, uh, shorter than the RCA building, which is itself not one of the tallest skyscrapers of New York. And this was the first competition that we took part with, with REM, which was a housing for Roosevelt Island, um, in which we incorporated the kind of a facing the river on the river, the, the kind of a gable, the gable facades of uh, Amsterdam and the traditional mid block and then series of streets, they, 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 it was facing 72nd Street. So we extended 72nd, 73rd, 74th, 76th Street along the length of it. And here's a facade of the project. And um, this is kind of an, an iso isometric breaking kind of a, breaking up the elements of the of the 72nd street in our part of the project in which we incorporate kind of the equivalence of brownstones incorporated into the slab that we propose with this being a perspective of it and then we move to we move to Europe, we moved to London, where we took part in the competition for the Tweede de Camer, the, the twin chambers for the uh, fortress, if you like, of uh, the uh, Dutch parliament, which consisted of a series of buildings date from, from medieval through classical to Renaissance to 19th century Victorian needing which one, so we incorporated the contemporary addition according to brief for the competition. And uh, the brief for our competition was to provide the deputies offices together with a new chamber and the, and the public gallery. And this being a model, and as with all the competitions that we did at the time, we didn't get anything. This is the axiometric of the, all the public spaces, the spaces used by, the, to, to which the public has access. And this is the deputy's floor. And um, we collaborated this project with Zaha. After which Zaha said, I'm never going to work with you again. Uh, and she went on to do her own projects, but we remained really close friends ever since. This is a facade, the model. And then the next thing we immediately did after that, another competition, the competition for the T-Shock. The T-Shock is the, Irish Prime Minister uh, competition in Phoenix Park in Dublin, um, which uh, we invited Zaha to join us. And she said, no, I'm going to do my own project. So basically the project were, consisted of, this was the first project in which we dealt with landscape. And we tried to take in existing features like existing curves within Phoenix Park, uh, as well as an existing feature like there was, for instance, there was a, a, an old keep, but then there were, the, there were these, these curves all around and around the, 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 the ju juncture of these curves, we put what was late, what, what 
later critics called the two bananas, which consisted of uh, the uh, one of the bananas was the the Taoiseach's private residence, and the other one was the Taoiseach's uh, uh, more public residence and, and meeting spaces. And to the left here, uh, there was an existing an, an existing vegetable garden, and we kept that vegetable garden. We kept the perimeter and we surrounded the perimeter with what the brief called for as a guest house, the guest house for visitors. And this is the project of the two parts together. And a few and two aerial views. And some illustrations of details that is the interior of the T shocks public spaces and some interior from the guest house. And one typical uh, juxtaposition of the two bananas axonometric with a part of axonometric of the guest house in one drawing. And this is uh, just one image of Zaha's project for the same competition with Zaha becoming really her own architect, but Zaha really becoming herself liberated, if you like, into being herself. Um, and now I move to Greece where um, I had, um, what was beginning to get some clients and there's a few the projects that made me gradually reject, uh, regret taking on commissions. And uh, with the last building I did, I, I, there's two buildings that I've built in my life, both of them, both of which contributed in my deciding that never to do architecture again. Um, this one was basically a project for uh, the uh, for the uh, a hotel uh, on the island of Lesbos, which was on on an all in an olive grove with a beach, uh, a, a hotel open uh, the rest of the year, and a little uh, for the whole the, the whole year. The bungalows only for the summer. And then there was a hill village, which was for hunters, open mostly in the autumn. And this is a view of it. And then the, uh, my involvement with my long involvement of over many years with Berlin. And this is the, an axonometric of Friedrichstrasse in Berlin at the time of the war, the green zone that you see is the area in the, in the, uh, in the Mitte, which was part of, which was part of the uh, Soviet, the, the East German part of, um, of Berlin, um, thus interrupting completely this very long um, street, commercial street. So at one end at the bottom, I don't know if you can see my, my, uh, my arrow at the, at the bottom of uh, Friedrichstrasse is an axonometric of uh, Mises uh, glass tower, which was never built. And at the other end, the uh, the end of uh, the, 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 the project, the, the end of Friedrichstrasse with a project by Mendelssohn and here is a th and, and here um, a project by um, Hilbersheimer. So Hilbersheimer, Mies uh, and Mendelssohn sort of contributed to the kind of a modern incorporation of architecture into Berlin. This is where the wall is, and be, be beyond the wall is a project that we did for Kreuzberg, 
together with REM um, to, to rehabilitate uh, to rehabilitate that part of Berlin, but being careful of retaining the kind of post bombardment of Berlin, because we, 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 we considered the bombardment of Berlin as one of its poignant historical moments, which uh, the Germans wanted to forget, and which, which we thought should not be forgotten as part of history and we, and it and the new urban landscape that had emerged which we thought was very exciting and the only difference was that along the wall we proposed only two story high buildings because we did not want to put, to put any high rise buildings in positions where inhabitants would look at people being mutilated by by dogs or shot by guards. And this was a kind of axonometric of the low rise uh, project near, near the war. Through the insistence of um, Kleihus, the, the chief architect of Berlin, West, West Berlin architect, uh, I had to comply with a 22 meter high buildings for to restoring uh, Friedrichstrasse to its traditional uh, urban fabric. Uh, Rem was uh, completely unwilling to, to, do, to take part. And he, he, he told me, it's your baby, you go ahead. Uh, I was very eager to, to do this building. I thought that the location was really very challenging. I thought that the the content of the brief was also equally challenging. Basically, the only concession I did to uh, Rem's uh, refusal to put people, do housing for people who could look into the uh, into the uh, East Berlin uh, into the East Berlin sites was to set the building, I think it was something like six or seven meters in from the building line so that the one wouldn't be able to see directly out and over the checkpoint. Mm -hmm. This is a photograph of the model. And this includes the, the very exciting part of the project, which is the the ground floor, which was a kind of a garage that um, incorporated the meeting spaces for, for the Allies. The Allies being uh, the British, the French, the Americans, and the Russians. And of course, the Russians never took part in it, but in theory, they ought to be able to take part in it. But by then, the Cold War was fully on. And this is um, a, a view of how the building was at the time. It has been completely ruined later by, by the owners, even though they had uh, undertaken to, uh, I was willing to turn the ground floor into commercial facilities and I was supposed to be the architect for it, but they completely ignored that agreement and they went ahead and completely butchered this building. So anyway, that's how it was at the time with some night views. And uh, wind, the wind, the wing uh, it kind of is, is like an airplane wing because that was the point at which during the 1948 um, supply of, uh, of uh, air, 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 air bridge to West Berlin. It was the point at which the Allied uh, airplanes had to, that were coming from the Tempelhof Airport, which was within Kreuzberg and within the West Berlin sector. At this point, they had to turn round and round and round and, and gain, gain a height, a minimum height that the, that the East Germans required before they would cross into East Germany. This was kind of one of the dramatic 
postcards from that period, which um, showed the, in fact, um, a British Airways plane taking off exactly over that point, passing over that point to reach the height. And beyond what you see beyond the wall is this desert land that was created by the East Germans. And this is a picture taken more recently of how the situation is today, commemorating the fact that this, is, this was where the checkpoint was. So a few axonometrics of the front and the back. The back, of course, was uh, all, all the orientation of the apartments was towards the back and the back gardens. And moving to Greece, and I'm going to go a bit more fast now. Um, I had um, the, my, I was, I was given this commission by a friend of mine who had bought this large piece of land on the island of Antiparos, which is now a very popular touristic resort. But in those days, it was rather empty island. And he bought a site on which he, he could build a large number of bungalows. Um, I mean, there were certain building regulations that one had to be very careful in laying out the maximum number of bungalows. And uh, I would, it was, you know, a commission directly to me, great excitement. And I visited the site and the fact then, it was just that when I was struck by the fact that until then, I had spent all my time and effort in in various aspects of urban architecture, metropolitan architecture, and the culture of congestion, as Rem had called it. But on this island, it was I was left uh, struck, dumbstruck that I didn't know what to do. Um, so I thought I'd make a model to, to, to look at the features of the site. There were was a very gentle slope. At one side, there was a little sort of dry river. At the top, there was an existing little bungalow hut that the, 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 the owner wanted to extend into a, into a living room with a panoramic view. And there was a wall running all the way up. So I thought the wall would be, and indeed it turned out to be the only, the only source of inspiration, um, but um, I was really, I, I built a model, looking at the model, and, and I, I, I really did not, it did not help me at all. And I, I remember that, um, uh, I remember that I was struck and the only thing it, it reminded me of was a pork chop. So it was the, the idea of the pork chop remained a sort of a joke about my response to this. But in the end, I realized that the question of the wall and, and the kind of a concept of uh, lines and dots and surfaces would make a composition. And for me, the, the notion of composition in architecture has always been primary. I have always been very, very, uh, uh, very much uh, the enemy of rationalism and rational architecture and the, um, the, um, the dogma that um, architecture is the product of rational analysis. To me, it was the product of, what, of, of an image that you have in your mind, which is an image which we, and the composition with which you proceed. Um, According to this, I, I managed to get the maximum number of bungalows, um, which I think was 21. But then the client started selling the site to the first buyer um, and, uh, and not following any of the subdivisions that I had made, uh, which were very, very careful to make sure that he got the maximum number. Uh, so in the end, he couldn't build any, any more than 16. Uh, and he thought that I was, he, he, he thought that I was um, uh, 
that that there was too much of a um, obsess that I was obsessive with uh, with my geometries that she called he called it etc. So anyway, it was a kind of satisfaction that he was a loser in the end because he did not manage to get the uh, amount of uh, of bungalows that I was able to get. This was the project, the photograph of the model, with the with the addition of the addition of the panoramic living room that he wanted to add on the on the existing top house. And this uh, layout, which, uh, which um, these bungalows, which Rem called confetti, so they kind of be the, the the notion of confetti uh, remained in our in our vocabulary in our collaboration with Rem. But they were they were very practical and useful for our project because immediately after that we took part in the project, in the competition for the Parc de la Villette in Paris, in which the, uh, the uh, equivalent of bungalows became necessary. But primarily the, 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 the concept was basically a series of strips that the, start, the, the, the starting feature, the only feature that existed on the side was this canal in the middle of it. There was 20, 25 meters wide. So we divided the whole site into 25 meters strips, taking into account the Museum of Modern Science that was being by, by Fran Silbert that was being built at the time. And one of the existing uh, um, al, the, which were kind of the uh, slaughterhouses, with kind of a 19th century slaughterhouses. They were the only two elements that were left. So they, those elements together with the canal became the kind of starting feature of dividing the site into strips and, and, into, and into five, basically into five layers. This, uh, these diagrams uh, here, these six diagrams sh show the, the, the process of how the design, the, how the design proceeded. To the, the one at the top, the top left-hand side, is um, shows the brief. Uh, in the bright strip on the left is the square square meters of um, of um, built-in internal um, in built-in areas, which were mostly equivalent to the bungalows of, from Antiparos. The, the next strip was the total area of again small small interventions but without a roof open air ones and the rest of the area was entirely open it was a park but it was a programmatic park heavily programmatic which meant that every strip was to be given a use for which there was a call in the brief. So the next top middle, middle uh, diagram shows the canal and all the, and the rest of the strips with uh, the, vol the big volumes of, uh, of the Saint Silbert Museum and, the, and one of the existing slaughterhouses. The third one on the right shows all the confetti, different with different briefs. The bottom diagram shows the circulation through the site. There was a one pedestrian avenue crossing in one go through all the briefs. And then a more tortuous promenade through which you could meander around the site. The middle of the bottom row is a composition of large objects some of them being organic, in other words, uh, made out of vegetal material, some of them being inorganic, meaning being buildings. And then the last sixth 
diagram was all the layers collapsed together into the total overall project. And these are a few images from the project. We were being uh, rumored by, by both um, the organizers and by, uh, I forget the name of the minister, um, that we would be the winners. So we went, we, we went in with a conviction. So this shows the diagram, how the, how the, the, the various grids for each of the little, as you can see, grid, there's a grid for small picnic areas, a grid for sales kiosks, a grid for other kiosks, uh, for refreshment bars, playgrounds, etc. So all of these were the little confetti and they each had a different grid. And um, okay, there was a formula for working out the grids, which is at the bottom of this page. So I'm not going to go into it. And that, and that's, here's the overall image. And then some photographs of the model that we constructed for the project. So you can see some of the Antiparos little bungalows reappearing here as kiosks or playgrounds or whatever. And then Bernard was the winner. It was a very traumatic experience. Um, we were to blame them to a certain extent, but I'm not going to go into the causes. Um, but Rem was inflexible uh, to any changes and uh, and uh, Mitterrand had told the juries of all the Grand Projet to make sure that they would opt, they would choose the, the cheapest um, possible option and, and that they would also ask the architects to revise their project to cut down costs. And Rem was against that. Anyway, so we lost it. As a consolation prize, we were given another project to do another park, the Park Citroën Seven on the South Bank, um, which then I did uh, with uh, together with Eleni Gigantes, which Eleni Gigantes, who is my my current partner and wife, um, and to which we basically did the project in which the, the existing uh, configuration. Of the, urban, of the urban tissue, which had a lot of modern buildings, would be mirrored inside to generate the formal, formal articulations of the park itself. We didn't get that one either. And I have to say that I don't know who the winners are, but they did a very beautiful project. The way the Park Citroën Seven today is a very beautiful park. And I moved to the more, my later, my latest collaboration projects, um, which were in collaboration with uh, another group of students of mine, uh, Pierre Vittorio Aureli, and Martino Tatara. And that was taking part in the, for the competition on the Hellenicon, the old, the old international airport of Athens to turn into a park. And we followed the brief very, very accurately. But what we did is that we, we, we the grid that we provided, because I always provided, I mean, nearly every project, especially the park projects relied very much on a grid. And the grid always had some kind of meaning to, relating to the surrounding tissue. I think, and here, the way it relate to the surrounding tissue was that the grid is denser towards those parts of Athens around the, around the old airport, which were dense and which were towards the center. Uh, and that, that part, the grid was getting denser and the parts 
of the of the site that were towards the more suburban parts along the coast, uh, the, the grid there we became larger. And we followed that grid for placing every aspect of the what was asked for in the program. So the plantations followed the grid, the building pattern of what was required followed the grid, and the circulation followed the grid. <clears throat> this is the result with the main uh, runway uh, being the uh, being the, the central the central uh, park avenue if you like pedestrian avenue of the park crossed by this the, by by a building that uh, or a series of platforms that go over the coastal highway so as to give access to the seashore to the park and here are the plans And a few illustrations, for instance, this is the <coughs> an illustration of the old runway, which was to be planted on either side with commercial facilities left and right. And there is a kind of drawings of, of different parts <coughs> of the park, which I'm not going to go into in any detail because I can see that I'm um, taking a long time. So I want to kind of shorten <coughs> the duration of this presentation. So these are various illustrations that we, we gave. <coughs> and here also are illustrations in which, for instance, we knew that there was going to be a lot of uh, new buildings which we provided spaces for, but as we didn't know what these buildings were going to be, we left them black. But here is where we use the influence from the painters that I talked about at the beginning of, of the talk from Magritte to, to Rousseau to Hockney uh, incorporated in our proposals of, and our drawings for this park. And this is an overall perspective. And immediately after that, um, we were invited by Fuxas who was the curator of the Venice Biennale in the year 2000. And he invited us to design a pavilion to be built next to the existing Greek pavilion. And uh, the amazing thing was, is, was that, uh, that uh, the, uh, the funds for, uh, for this, I, man I managed to get the funds for doing this from the Greek government, which was kind of like almost a miracle. Now, I did this project and, and this project, the design of this project is uh, entirely uh, a design of Eleni, of Eleni Gigantes, my, my current partner and, um, and, uh, and current wife and partner. And, the, and it was against the allergy that we both had to all biennales in Venice. I've, I've always found the biennales in Venice amongst the most boring uh, events that could happen to one when you have the whole, the magic of Venice itself to waste time going to, through these dreadful exhibitions in the Giardini. Uh, sweating the heat of, of summer when one could be enjoying the, the magic of Venice itself. Uh, so what the, the ba basically the, pro the, the concept of the project was to provide a, a space in which one could rest, refresh oneself with water and refreshing, uh, refreshing juices from the product produce of Greece, etc., uh, and not waste any time, just relax. Hence, the déjeuner sur l'herbe by uh, by uh, by Manet. And uh, uh, image of the 
model in which kind of uh, inferences from Zaha to Super Studio are incorporated in the proposal? And the amazing thing is that though we were not able to build the whole thing, we were able to build part of it. Uh, and, and within it, uh, there was a projector that was projecting our work. And this leads to the, the, the other uh, project in Greece, which was the uh, park for the Bay of Kutavos on the island of Cephalonia which was a, a what I call the liquid park. The, part, the, the, object, the object of which was to, to turn a, a kind of very polluted uh, bay for the, for, the, uh, for, the, uh, for the capital of the island into an oxygenated park. What, so I called it a liquid park. It was, um, we were commissioned this um, by the, uh, by the, the minister of culture at the time, who himself was uh, an architect educated in the United States and who had seen the park, the La Villette, and he wanted something like that. So basically the, the argument with him was the Parc de la Villette was for a metropolis of millions. And this is a little town of, uh, uh, of 20,000 at most. And uh, we have to really do something which is according to the scale and the landscape. I'm not going to go into any detail. Eleni had just designed at the time a, a, a hotel for the island, on the island. And following the, uh, we, we were given two, two briefs. One was the, the bay that I told you. The other was a beach and the problem with the beach was to how to get down onto a beautiful sandy beach going through rocks from a height of 12 meters above where I had to find a way of going down but using the rocks also as part of the architecture and then the bay of Kutavos was to be the, as I said a liquid park in which uh, wherever there was the potential for a park that was an all the activities that go with the park were designed to go along with it. Uh, and in order to cut a long story short, this is one of the drawings which combines the, com the, 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 my obsession with, uh, with the composition, with the actual practicality of, uh, of specifying trees so that each number uh, corresponds to a particular tree. So that uh, you get the groups of trees, which at the same time follow the, uh, the, 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 the desired combination of uh, composition that, uh, that uh, I wanted for the park. And this was a, again, the last competition that we won and which drove me to my final decision, never ever to have to deal with the vicissitudes of architecture in any way other than conceptual and painting and drawings. We won the competition for the, for the uh, administrative center of the, of, the, of the Flemish administrative center in, uh, in Flanders, of Flanders, in the city of Leuven, next to the Leuven railway station which we did together with um, Eleni and I, and which we did, and this is a perspective, a perspective of it. Next, the, 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 you have a perspective, a photograph of the, of the uh, bus station, then our, then our project, and then the railway station, all put together. Um, and our project was, uh, built and designed entirely almost a 100% floors and walls in a kind of a beautiful local yellow brick from Leuven. Um, 
and it won the first prize and we won the contract and we went the only thing we we knew is was that there was a local architect who was a member of the local council who coveted this work despite this and he tried several times to compete with us he managed to to fi find our drawings and to copy them and to make submissions with copies of our drawings etc he was he was uh, very uh, uh, severely taken off the list by the local by the by the chief Flemish architect. Uh, so he was pushed away. We got the job. We got the contract. We were we were in the midst of uh, of. Uh, of, of building uh, the building. And um, uh, in the midst of the uh, working drawings period, we lost the job and, we, and the council gave it to this architect. It was one of the biggest scandals in uh, Belgium, but then I, re I discovered that Belgium was even more corrupt than Berlin, which was very corrupt, which, even, which, which turns out to be even more corrupt than Greece has ever been. The corruption was so unbelievable that the moment the, the, the uh, chief architect was replaced, we lost the job, even though we had the contract. And it was given to this uh, architect who was coveting the job, and he did the building using our drawings. But he changed he changed the materials. It was uh, one of the bitterest experiences uh, that one of the experiences that uh, um, made I had already uh, that made me advise my son, my growing son at the time, to never ever consider being an architect. I kind of, I had already advised my, young, my older children against architecture, but um, my youngest child, my youngest son, I told him, keep away from it. It's the most corrupt profession you can ever have. So I'm going to skip now. There's a series of projects that I, that I did with the Berlache for one of them is for um, for uh, Seoul uh, in Korea. But basically, the project, the idea was that uh, a city of be beyond 11 million people that keeps on that keeps on growing cannot have a center, but is a is a city with many centers. And we provided a series of uh, centers uh, along the River Han and also around the perimeter of the city to provide a certain kind of limits for the city. And uh, these are illustrations of some of the projects that we did, some of which were interpretations of my obsession at the time, which was this immobile cité that I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, you know, the, the, the building that is also a city. And these are some illustrations of interventions using this typology in various, now, now we're moving to, to Greek cities. This is in Athens, this is in Salonika. And uh, these are various illustrations by students. This is from a group of uh, my Yale students who did um, a project along the existing traces of the classical long walls of antiquity, which are one, one main avenue, major avenue uh, that links Athens to the port of Paris, and also the tracks of the railway surface tracks of the of the of the first line of the underground 
metro. The, 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 they run in parallel exactly where the, the, uh, the old uh, long walls were. Here you can see them running in this aerial photograph of Athens. I don't know if, you, if I can use my, my, if you can see my arrow. There are these, these two parallel lines there. If they're visible, I hope they're visible. These two parallel lines are the site. And, they, and this is one of the proposals so from my group from Yale University, where I was, where I'm teaching in the fall semesters every two years. A similar project in, done by a group of students from, uh, from um, uh, the Patras University, the Greek University, where I'm teaching, where we went to, we, we had a site in Marseille uh, for the whole semester was based on, on the old port of Marseille, which was being emptied because uh, at the moment the port, the port of Marseille was moving away, which meant that the port, which normally does not belong to the municipality, was given over to the municipality uh, and one could part. This was a project that was going under the sea, the submerged project, um, from which you had views into the underground, underwater views. And this is um, the last project ever built. Um, the, pro the, the, the project which said, goodbye to any possible future clients. Though these clients were reasonably interesting, though the builder was not, because the builder kind of changed my, changed our drawings, our, our, our uh, facades, for instance, without letting us know. <laughs> I mean, the things I've been through, anyway, I owe this project to, we owe this project to, to Arata Isozaki, who, we, to, to, to whom we, we were, uh, actually we were celebrating his 70th birthday somewhere we were, because we, uh, yeah, we had been teaching also at uh, the Kokagwin Kok uh, University in Tokyo. And um, he said, you know, you are, he said, you are, since you are Mediterranean architects, I have a Mediterranean site for you. And I want you to build us a, a, a Greek hill village. So that was the site. It looked Mediterranean, but did not feel at all Mediterranean because the humidity in the summer was incredible. To long, cut the long story short, we received a, a letter from the engineers, the, the the, the municipality engineers who, who told us to make the life, the, the, to make it easier for you, we, we're sending you some drawings to let you know that we, we flattened your site. We were struck. So we, how can we flatten the site when ESO said that, <coughs> that, that uh, he wants a hill village? It's a kind of uh, absolutely strict instructions by Esau. And Esau was really treated like a god by all people. He said, ah, oh, yes, but we have to have a football field and we have to have X number of cars parked. He said, but you still have a little bit of the slopes <coughs> and you can put back the hill with your roofs. Essentially, that's what our project was became. It was a, a battle to try to can, cancel out the flatness of, of the flattening of the slope by putting back the profile that had been taken away with the roofs of the buildings that we put back. I'm not going to go into um, a lot of detail uh, about this, I, I will run through the project in order not to take too much more time to show how we handle this. 
how we handle this one particular issue, how the roof of this project reinstated the outline of the curves that had been taken away. And this is taken from a greater height. In the foreground is the, is the parking. Here you have a better view. In the foreground is the parking lot and the football field. And behind it is the curvature of our roofs that replace the outline that had been taken away. And I don't think you need to make any more. We go to the last project, which was the kind of uh, uh, end of the line, uh, another competition that we did. This time, again, in collaboration with, uh, with Dogma, with uh, Pierre Vittorio Aureli, and uh, the magician of the Photoshop, Martino Tatara, um, which was uh, to, to, to do to redo the, the, the shoreline of, of the city of Flore in the Albania. It's in a protected part of the Ionian Sea, of the Adriatic, because there's an island between the city and, uh, and the open sea. So we provided with a kind of a, a promenade, and it also had some little pine, pine forests that were along the seashore. So we, we, we gave a zone of, of, uh, of pine forests and a series of piers going into the town. The, and the piers took up functions, outdoor functions that were, of, of, that were taking, that became magnets for the, the city with one major one in the, in the middle where most of the municipal buildings are together with the marina. Uh, and uh, this is this last project shows how we went through answering that, that brief, uh, which is a program for which we again, we were rumored that we were going to be the winners, but which again, was given to somebody who had done more or less a similar thing, but without any architecture, just with, just with pine trees. So basically, how the project went, first the piers, then a promenade, then the pine, for, the pine forest linked to the promenade, then the uh, installation in the, which was, a, and the biggest pier which was in line with the, with the biggest avenue that went deep into the center of the city. Then with a number of floating facilities that would go from pier to pier, giving some life into the kind of still waters of the bay. And then to very small confetti-like floating facilities or land facilities attached to the promenade. And this is the overall view. You can see that the main, the, long, the, lo the longest pier uh, is at the, where the, the main avenues of the city converge. And some details. showing ways in which the piers could be used and the ways in which they would relate to both the city and to the sea, which as I said, was very protected because of the island that was beyond protecting it from the open Adriatic. Various hours, various times of the day, looking back towards the city. In the evening used by fishermen. And at night as an open air cinema.
And this concludes the presentation of today. I hope I uh, illustrated what I wanted to say about the, the, the narrative that the image carries way and above the actual architecture itself, but as an explanation and as an intention, the intentionality rather of the idea of the image. Um, and I apologize if uh, there were a few small snags in the presentation that um, I hope you'll be able to edit. And thank you very much.